Uh, now I've already been introduced. I, I was born in South Africa but, uh, by German parents and I grew up in Hamburg in Germany and uh, studied there and also in Stuttgart in the south before moving to Switzerland where I lived 16 years and then moving to Paris and now I'm since 2016 half of my time in the United States in Corona del Mar and half of the other time in Paris. I'm an industrial designer by training. Uh, there are different uh, descriptions for the departments where I studied in Hamburg it was uh, Produktgestaltung and Stuttgart is industrial design, so it's product design, industrial design. You know our profession suffers a little bit from being so young. If you're an architect since 5,000 years, people know that you're building houses. If you're a designer, product designer, they don't know exactly whether you're a mechanical engineer or whether you're one of these artists that does crazy things and gives funny shapes. Uh, it's not very clear and you always have to explain to your clients what you're doing. So you better get good at it. Um, at this moment in time, I'm busy with these three things and I'm going to explain a little bit before I'm talking about tonight's topic so that you get a bit more of my background and I hope it's also an encouragement and inspiration for your dreams. So the first thing is I have a design office since 1990. That's last century. And uh, this design office started in Switzerland when I was still working at the uh, Art Center. Art Center Pasadena had a campus in Switzerland and I was product design chairman there. And parallel to that work at the school, I started my design office. And uh, in this design office, I'm doing different things. I not, not only do product design, but also corporate design. That means I'm working on projects that involve logos and packaging and everything around a company's brand's uh, image. And i show you one example from a South Korean client, Romansan. Uh, that's actually the largest watch manufacturer in South Korea. And they came to me and said, you know, we have this logo here that shows that we were two partners in the beginning working together for a common future. And our name uh, is supposed to sound slightly European because, you know, we, um, the company boss went to a town called Romanshorn in Switzerland and he liked that and also he liked the connotation with romantic uh, uh, everything because the main product is watches for husband and wife that they exchange for their wedding and then later on, 10 or 20 years later, when they celebrate their anniversary, they change, exchange watches again, which is a very nice business idea, by the way. So they came with this and said, uh, can you help us to do something more international? And uh, that's the development. And when I showed this to them, it was interesting that they said, yeah, but the original logo was more of a square proportion. And yours seems very, very, very long and elongated. And uh, I had to think for a while and I said, well, you know, there's no need. I can make that more square. But the reason why you made it square is probably because your alphabet, the Korean Hangul alphabet, is based on square shapes. And so everything that is not square to you always appears too high. I wanted, you know, to show this uh, resembling a letter R, like Romanson, at the same time keeping the elements, the two people working together for a mutual future. And then they thought about it and said, yeah, okay, yeah, we understand, now we want this. Because I said, you can do the other thing if you want to be more Korean, this would be more international. And that was really what I was convinced about. And they followed that argument. And then I made the adaptation on the bottom left for the Hangul Korean version, for Japanese version and for the Arabic version. There's a little side story to that. Uh, I have no idea how to write in kanji or katakana or whatever alphabet that is. And uh, so Romans on people gave me a sheet of paper where this was scribbled on and said, use this for the logo. And I was a bit skeptical and I sent it to a nice friend. I have a British friend who is married to a Japanese wife. And I sent it to him and he said, uh, wait a minute, I know somebody in Japan, he'll look at that. And the guy sent it back and said, that looks like drawn by a seven-year-old kid. You, know, you can't do that. You know, I'm doing a nicer one for you. Here, take this you know, for free. It's sometimes good to have friends. 
And so I used that, and of course the people in Romanson, you know, they, they said, yeah, it's nice. Unfortunately, I don't know anybody in an Arab country at the time who could tell me, so maybe that looks like drawn by a seven-year-old camel driver. I don't know that, but I haven't heard any complaints. Sometimes you just have to wing it. From the logo on, I did all the adaptations for the price uh, tickets and ID cards and warranty cards and whatever is necessary. It extended very far into you know what's on the facade of the buildings, the logo, and on the cars, and even the dresses for the employees because that's a customary thing in South Korea, at least at the time. And packaging and uh, gift bags until the actual products. That's a ceramic watch I designed for them. So the challenge for the design in this case and the, it's a rewarding challenge is that you can really influence the whole appearance of the company from the first business card to the last product uh, through packaging, through everything. And that, that's a, a big project. You know, this project, excluding the watch, took one year. And half a year was used up by the company deciding which way they want to go because, you know, I don't give them one logo and say, this is it. I show them different ones. And, and uh, in a very Asian way, they try to get everybody on board. And that takes time to negotiate among them to make sure that everybody is happy with the final result. This is a very different company. There's a startup company out of Paris run by an American guy. And he wanted to work in luxury men's grooming. Uh, that means like high-end razors primarily. And the first thing I found a name because the company had no name. You know? So I found this and I'm actually from all the names I created, I think this is one of the best. You know? Homage is a French word for homage, means to honor somebody, and since the French word homme for man is in there, it's just honoring the man, you know. For once men are sexy, you know, whether they are unshaven or freshly shaven, or while they are shaving, you know, they always look sexy. Women, you never see them shaving, they withdraw in the shower or so. We, we know that some women shave, apparently, you know. I'm sure there are some areas that my girlfriend shaves, you know. I don't need to know the details, it's just that for once, we men are sexy, yeah? so we celebrate that, we, we celebrate homage. After the logo, I designed the packaging for the skincare product. Uh, this is uh, supposed to resemble like a, a mechanical instrument, like a spark plug on a Harley Davidson or something. You know, not, not a little frilly perfume thing, but uh, this switches, uh, this locks closed and open without having to take the cap off. So it's, it's a very mechanical thing that we thought would uh, be interesting for men to use. There's a whole range of packaging going with that. See some razors in there already, and uh, that is the flagship razor. It has a magnetically attached uh, razor on the back, and also the brush you can take off it. Sticks to it with a magnet, which is a bit you know magical and a bit technical. And that was quite successful and got a design award in Japan. Uh, and this is uh, an interesting product because it was only really produced once. Uh, we had a PR company that said, you should do a super expensive razor. You should create the most expensive razor in the world. Why? Because we're a startup company. We don't have any money for advertising. It's just too expensive. I mean, to put a page in a, in a nationwide publication is way over budget. So we said, we create this razor. We, found one of the three guys on this planet that does Damascene steel for razor blades. And you know Damascene steel is a, is a technology that's ancient, it's from 1200 before Christ, that people took mild steel and hard steel and forged it on top of each other and folded it around and always forged it until they had this lingot which they could cut and then grind the blade from, in this case, the razor blade. And there's really only three guys that does that for razor blades. There's many guys doing it for kitchen or hunting knives or whatever. But for razor blades, there's one guy in Japan, one in the United States, and one in Germany. He's a retired guy in, in a city that only does knives. You know, it's like Sheffield in Germany. It's called Solingen. So we paid a thousand Deutsche uh, uh, euros, a thousand euros, which is twelve hundred dollars about, for the blade. And we said the price for this will be thirty thousand dollars. Now, we, we also had to engineer all that, so uh, this sheath is platinum coated, uh, including the engineering on that, there was way over 3,000 that we spent for this one prototype. 
And the reason why it was 30,000 is that this is uh, a number that's you know, really stirring the media. And we got into Newsweek. And we got into Newsweek before the prototype was finished. So what they showed there was one of my renderings that was pretty photorealistic. But I thought this is a good example to show how with little means a startup company can get free advertising in Newsweek, you know? Okay, you still have to pay 3,000 for, for the development, but at that time the company was running, so we had some turnover and got some money in. I also work on interface design. You know, interface design, basically interface, as you know, is the contact area between men and machines, so um, it's the handle of the hammer, so to speak, or in the case of a coffee machine, it's that little touch screen on the top, with well, a coffee machine, it's fairly simple, you know? When you want a coffee, you want a certain size and a certain strength. If you're not familiar with the 20 varieties that the modern Jura coffee machines offer, this is pretty much it. And you want to go there at a very easy, in a very easy way. Uh, the development of this interface was done with the engineering department and the marketing department, so it's not something that I did alone. Uh, this is all always teamwork, and then we devised some way, how do we do this in the simplest way? This is a remote control for model airplanes. That is fairly sophisticated, because to fly a model airplane follows the same physical laws as flying a real plane. Sorry. So all the presets you have to do for a real flight, you have to do on a model plane too, and here are four example screens that show you all the things you have to put in, you know, how much trim here and how much trim there to get the thing flying. And uh, that was a fairly complex interface project. Of course, you have to do all the graphics and all the little icons, and I've become an icon designer. I li actually like doing icons. It's like doing an alphabet. It's like typography, just typography is even more sophisticated. I have a very high respect towards typographers. And this is not to confuse you or to shock you, it just shows that for uh, our flagship client in the interface area, we have very much higher uh, expectations on the client side. So this is the kind of graph we get from them, and we have to make sense of that. The machines that they do are mass spectrometers or gas chromatographs, and if you would know how bad I was in school in chemi chemical engineering or what is it called in chemistry, I, I really sucked, you know. And here you get a 600 page manual that teaches you how to work with a gas chromatograph. And uh, it took me weeks to read that through. And then you understand it only to a certain point when you're a designer like me, you know. I mean, if you're a chemical engineer, you probably fully understand everything from A to Z, but I had a hard time. And you know, when I do an interface for a coffee machine, that's not the problem. I know how to make coffee but I don't know how to gas chromatograph well. And still you have to understand it to just that level that allows you to improve that interface and make it better, you know? And it's not just a matter of pretty graphics, that's one side. But I'll show you here. That's a patentable interface because I put the first level of the hierarchy in the four corners, so whatever page of that interface you're on, you always have these elements in the four corner, so you can always go to the second highest hierarchy levels. The highest is always home. But we don't have a home button because we don't need a home button. We can immediately go to the second level. So we eliminated the first level completely. If you know about interfaces, then you know that eliminating a hierarchy level is really striking gold. You want to have as few levels as possible. So that, that was, was a big success. And it was particularly difficult because that company has different companies in Sweden and in Singapore and in Syracuse, New York, and in Switzerland, and in countries even starting without the S. So there is, and all over the place they have different products, products that sniff gas from the ground, or in machines, or in war zones, or in environmental protection areas. And all these had to be standardized with the interface. And to get them all to agree that you can only have four points on the top surface of your hierarchy level, that was the politically difficult thing to do. But we managed. So the core of my activity in views design is product design. So I do all kinds of things. I'm not specialized. I enjoy not being specialized. 
because it's much more interesting if you're always dealing with different products. You know, you have always something new to learn, and you can have this synergy effect that what you've learned with coffee machines, what can you apply there with a gas chromatograph or with a wall clock? That's another coffee machine. It's for a different client. It's uh, one of these sieve holder machines, so it's not as sophisticated as the other ones. This is one for Nespresso. It works with the capsules. And the, my, whoops, there's always a hesitation with the slide. I think it's probably because it's so big. Oh. There's something wrong with it. Yeah, here it is. Oopsie, now it goes too fast. Doesn't like me. Okay. That's the most recent one for my flagship client, Jura, in that coffee machine sector. So on the left you fill in the water, on the right you fill, uh, no, in the middle you fill in the beans. It used to be on the right, and I'll come to that later when I talk about design and how design should communicate. But that's uh, the most recent machine. So that is uh, very modern. It is controlled, controls itself, cleans itself. You can uh, hook it up to the internet and, and it can communicate with the factory and tell you when it needs to be serviced, etc., etc. They sell it with them Sonoma. So I'm not advertising, I'm not getting any royalties on that one, unfortunately. Uh, otherwise, I'd be a multi gazillionaire. <laughs> this is a um, remote control uh, for uh, model airplanes, but a very cheap one. And it just shows you the scope. So sometimes the first one that I showed you was about $1,000. And this here cost $100, including the model. So you can imagine how little money is left to do a decent product to remote control it. And just with the different textures, glossy and matte, and <coughs> smartly taking the expensive chrome button from the high-end model and using that here, because it already exists, you don't need to develop it. And it's affordable, even if you don't want to invest a lot. You can make a decent product. This is uh, an overview over some of the clients I've worked with. And you see there are some really big brand names like Kodak or Samsung in there. And then there are some that you've never heard of because they're so small. So I'm, I'm not picky. As a designer, frankly, you cannot afford to be picky and say, I only work for what kind of company. No, you pretty much you take what you want. It does not mean that you're a prostitute, but you're you're, you're hoping for, for good uh, projects, and uh, if you're lucky, and I consider myself lucky, you have these what I call orchid projects, projects that are really interesting, you know, that are visible, uh, where the technology behind is uh, up to date. For instance, for Jura, the, the coffee machine company, basically every single machine we do, we, we won a design award. Yes, of course, because we are fantastic. Uh, designers, but it's also because there's a good technology and a high quality behind, you know. And for instance, that company with the remote control for the airplane, that's a small German company. I don't think you'll ever get a design award for it, you know, because they, they just don't have the manpower, because it's not so easy to apply for a design. You know, you need to ask somebody to invest on so many hours and filling out the forms and sending it there and making sure they get the model, etc., etc., and they just don't bother about it. So there's advantages working with big and small companies. And then there are some of the design award we won. When I say we, um, I'm alone in my office, but uh, aside the office here in, in Corona de Mar and in Paris, I'm also affiliated with a friend who has one in Basel, who also works under the name Views Design. And we work on projects together, and we work separately on things. And he's actually made a lot more design awards than I have, but these are the ones that, that I made. So there's a lot of German awards in there, and um, the la latest one is the bottom right, the Australian. You know, I, I found out like two years after we got there that we won that award. I have to go to Australia. So aside views design, I'm also active in Napgear. Napgear is a startup company out of San Diego. And it consists of four people. Uh, I'm, I'm the dumbest. I'm the only one that doesn't have a PhD. They're very smart people. There's a German, a Tunisian, and a Chinese, and, and another German, me. And we're working on sleep technology. And I want to show you what happens when you work as a designer with a startup. So the first thing that I did for them, when I met them, their name was Relaxer. And as you can see, they had a 
they, they were not dyslexic. The problem was that relax.com was already taken. So they said, oh, let's drop the A. I said, wait a minute, re relax? No, nobody knows how to spell that. Nobody will remember that. They will remember that it was very odd, but they won't remember how to spell that. You can't do that. You can just not go ahead with that. You have to find something else, you know? And then I designed a name for them. And uh, nap gear, you know? Everything related to sleep, you're, you're gonna do gear. And they really liked that, you know? And napgear.com was, you know, when you go online, you find whatchamacallit.com, that's probably 11.99. And then there are some names that cost $20,000. And I would never spend more than $1,000. But for a startup, it was $500 uh, to pay for Napgear. That, that's OK. You can do that if the name is really good, if you're convinced that it's good. But there are some people that go around and say, oh, anything that has one or two syllables that can be very well pronounced, so, so I buy. So they spend $11.99 here and there and here and there. And I've done this probably 10 years ago. And now they sell it. And they sell it depending on how much they think this name is worth. But as I said, 500, I think, is OK. And then I designed a logo for them. Uh, uh, it's actually pretty neat, forgive me for saying that myself, but if you look at it, you know, the letters A, E, and G are not necessarily the same, but if you look at the logo, they're actually identical. They're just you know, mirrored and turned upside down. And that's what makes that logo interesting, I think. And my partners agree with me there. And then I designed what I call the snoozy something that captures the spirit of what we do. You know, we're about sleep. What is sleep? Sleep is a closed eye. That's one thing that shows sleep. And that hopefully will become more and more important to us. And I dream of one day when we're as big as Nike, we're going to have, instead of a swoosh, we're going to have a little snoozy there. So I'm working on that. So what else do you do when in a startup? You know, it's a self-financed startup. Uh, you can always find investors. Uh, it sounds like a good idea. I've worked with investors in companies and startups where I've been involved, and it means somebody's looking over your shoulder and tells you how to get the <coughs> million or the two or the five that they've invested as fast back as possible. And that puts a pretty big pressure on you. And then, you know, because they put that money in, a good part of the business belongs to them. And when you're bootstrapping, like we do in Napgear, you own everything. That doesn't mean a lot at the moment, but it's ours, you know, that's the nice thing. So we start with this very low-tech sleeping mask. And you know, normally a sleeping mask has its one string around, and it pulls over your eyes and restricts the eye movement. And as you perhaps know, the phase of sleep that is the deepest is the so-called REM, rapid eye movement phase. And uh, it wasn't me who came up with the great idea for the straps, it was our engineer, who was really a fabulous guy. He learned how to use a sewing machine for this project. He's a hands-on guy that at the same time can code and can come up with great ideas. He's really somebody I have the highest respect for. And he came up with this cross-strap system. Why is it cross-strap? Because like this, you only have to uh, regulate one point to make it fit. And that's important. The advantage of this mask is that you don't have to pull it very tight. Because of these four straps, you can have it really loose on your face. I mean, it's made of 100% silk. You don't feel it. When you wake up in the morning, you've forgotten that it's there, but it's still on your head. You know, So it's really a, a very good system. And my job, you see here, was to put that in 3D and visualize it and make it explain to the users what this would look like you know, and decide where the logo goes and decide, of course, the shape of the mask. Honestly, to design the shape of the mask, it took me an afternoon. That was, that was like really nothing. But it was, I was much longer busy with these renderings. You know. And then you have to do visualization before the first samples come from China, to, so you can put something on the website, and that you can uh, start to work on the packaging. There's some paper pulp packaging. There is uh, just a sleeve and a, and a cellophane thing and the final solution was this one. We had a die made and uh, that folds up like this and there's an explanation, a little welcome in there and then the mask and then there's uh, uh, illustrations how, how this works. So you see there's very little product design and nap gear for me up to the state. We have projects to do more sophisticated products, electronic products. That's the actual starting point how we decided to do that company. 
but we need to make that money first to allow us to pay for that research. So you do these kinds of things. And uh, since we are very active in social media, because you know we need to make people aware that we exist, we talk about sleep. Oh, sorry, we talk about sleep, and so, uh, I was too fast there. And I'm designing these little icons that go with these articles we write about sleeping, because we realize that uh, they they are attracting attention. People are more interested when you come up with a little graphics and. I hear how sleeping helps you lose weight and uh, how the time change affects it, how uh, teenagers are suicidal when they don't get enough sleep and how you should take a hot shower before going to bed and all these things, you know. So there's the early bird and the night owl. So we're, we're talking about all kinds of things and I always have to come up with, I have always to come up with an illustration for that topic. And you know, sometimes uh, my colleague says, oh, tomorrow I want to post this. Can you quickly make something? So I, at times, do one or two a day and aside the work that I do otherwise. So you have to be very quick for that. And this is where it's good that I've designed 300 icons for that chromatograph company, you know. Here, some packaging design, an idea what these drops could look like. They will never look like this because we're going to buy them ready-made, you know. We're not going to produce them ourselves, but sometimes it's good you send this to colleagues and say, that's the ideal, that's where we want to go. Now let's see what we can finance in the time that we have to get this to the market. You have to be able to compromise. That's a, a nap, how do you say? Just a blanket. Okay, that's nap gear. And since one week I have this enterprise going on and it's something uh, that I like talking about. It's, it's, it's like a hobby almost. You have to know that I've written a book about design that will be published in the fall of this year and it's about iconic designs, you know, famous designs like, like this one here, the flip-flop that you may have seen before. It was designed by a Scottish guy for the Brazilian World Cup and is extremely popular. It's called the Havaianas in Brazil because Brazilians think Hawaii is cool. I personally think Hawaii is cool, so I feel with them, but Brazil is cool too. So anyway, they call it Havaianas, and I made this drawing, and it's one of the 120 iconic designs in my book. And you know, I went overboard. I did 350 drawings of designs that I think are iconic and important. I just chose the 120 for my first book. My second book is about iconic furniture design. And then I go from there. I have some other book ideas. So I had these illustrations and thought, okay, I need to promote the book because that's what you need to do today as a writer. You cannot just rely on your publisher. And I thought I could have some t-shirts made with that or coffee mugs and so on. I thought, okay, you know, let, let me make a website. And then, oh, you need a logo. So I designed that logo. It has the I and the X in there and the colors because there's different colors. Uh, my, my book will look like this. That, uh, that's the title page. And I did not want to repeat the illustrations inside. So these are all monochromatic illustrations. And inside, they're more realistic. They look like, well, in this case, it's just black. You can't see because that's just a black chair. And there's a little bit of text. Uh, if you, before you call me a writer, my book has as much text on average as a children, ch children books have, you know. So I, I'm not, I'm not Hemingway, you know. But I'm just a designer, I'm doing this uh, for fun. So there has 250 pages like that, and I said, I have these illustrations, and I can print these on t-shirts. And here are some of these illustrations, you see, I, I, it goes on and on and on, uh, more and more and more coming. So you see some of the products you may know, like the scissors here on the, on the right, or the IBM typewriter. Or so it's chronologically organized, and to have some orientation, I have this rainbow colors as a background, so you will see where in time you are, so you're going forwards or backwards. My next book is already in the planning. It's about iconic furniture, I said that. I've actually started to work on the third, which is about brands, but it's a different thing. So here's the website for the t-shirts. And it's funny how I got from thinking, oh, iconic design is interesting, and I want to tell people about designs they may know, but they may not know how, 
how iconic they are and why they are iconic. Because some people say, yeah, that's a really cool design. And I always, I keep seeing that, but I don't know why, you know. And in the book I talk about that, and then I thought, okay, let me use that work that I already did to promote the book and uh, to, to sell those t-shirts. And uh, it has a strong concept on the back. You see, you see the logo, so and when people go to a concert, you know, you can see, ah, oh, these people are wearing that t-shirt. You know? So that, that's a side thing. This is just that you see, so I have a design office, but I'm also in that startup that takes increasing amount of time and hopefully also brings increasing amount of money. I'm still waiting for that part. And then I'm doing this other thing on the side, which is not like just gardening or cooking. Cooking, I'm, I'm not a gardener, but I'm a cook. I really like to cook or making cocktails. But those are things that are all in line with my, my dreams and my passion. And now I'm going to talk about the topic, actually, about candid creations. So I thought, I want, I want to talk to you about something that is close to my heart. It's important to be honest, to be candid. And you know, of course, I used candid because candid creations is an alliteration, and I kill for alliterations. I just love them. <laughs> and I was inspired by this quote from Dieter Rams, who was one of the most important designers of the company Braun, as we pronounce it, or Braun, as you may say, which Brown, by the way, means brown, brown color. <coughs> and he postulated 10 rules for design. What is good design? Because, you know, design is something subjective. It's not that we can say, oh, there's one way how to design. No, there's unlimited amount of ways how to design. And so, as a consequence, we should be interested what constitutes good design. And he postulated these 10 rules, and one of the rules, he said, Good design should be honest, you know? It does not make a product more innovative, powerful, or valuable than it really is. It does not attempt to manipulate the consumer with promises that cannot be kept. Um, I don't say I subscribe 100% to that because it's something worth discussing, you know? You can discuss what is manipulation. If you show that something looks very strong, how strong does it actually have to be so that I'm still honest as a designer. The goal of tonight's presentation is that you start to think about this, not to give you a fixed answer. So I looked up Candid, and Candid says, truthful and straightforward Frank. And I realized that whenever you are truthful, you can go overboard, you know, that, that, that's true, let's assume it's true at the, for the moment, but it's pretty much in your face, and there may be reason for you not to want to do that. In any case, this is just a text. It's not that the product or the packaging itself shows and represents that's a very strong coffee. <laughs> so when you're talking about being candid and being honest, you always put that in relationship to truth. But it's not only truth that counts, it's also facts. And the difference between facts and truth is one is an objective concept. Facts is anything that you can scientifically measure and truth is a subjective concept. When you look at it from a legal point of view, it just gets even more complicated. So let's stay with the design phase. And let's just say there are rational criteria and emotional criteria. So when we say designers should be candid, what should designers be candid about? What is the core of what we do as designers? And let me ask you that as a question, and I'd be interested to hear some answers. What do you think? we do as designers? What's the most important thing that we do as designers? Empathize. Empathize? That's very good. It's, uh, it's almost uh, in a meta level, yeah? We, we should empathize with, with the consumers. That's, that's a very good approach, yes? Communicate. Excellent. Uh, very good, very good. Solve problems. Solve problems, <laughs> yep. I'm actually very happy already with the communication because that's what I wanted to hear, but that doesn't mean that is the only or the, the truest answer, you know. But I think that at the core of what we do, there is communication. If we have to empathize, empathize, sorry, we also have to emphasize, but we have to empathize. And uh, when we empathize with the consumer, it's just our basic attitudes to the consumer. It doesn't explain what we then actually do. But what we are busy with, or what we should be busy with, is communication. So we have the designer, we have the product, and at the end there's the user. And we use the product to communicate, 
to the user. Now, every designer comes with intentions, comes with a certain skill set, experiences, abilities, and on the other side, there's the user that has certain expectations and also experiences and abilities. And those experiences and abilities are important for the communication process. You know, how sophisticated can that be? Can the consumer read what we try to write for him? Because as you know, every communication uh, has suffers from these possible lags. What's said is not heard, and what's heard is not understood. What's understood is not retained. A lot of problems in any communication chain. And now we're not alone in this as a manufacturer. There's a client, as hopefully the, the entity that pays us, the designer, and enables us to work. And then it doesn't happen in a vacuum, but there's an environment around that. And the manufacturer has to deal with marketing, with the brand that he wants to establish. Sometimes this is more important than the actual sales. If you look at Tesla, Tesla is losing money, but the brand is incredibly valuable, you know, because it's a promise. There are great things going to happen. You know, that's what the brand is about. And the environment consists of the market and consists of the production and everything that is restrictive in the production. There's the recycling, there's the distribution that has an impact on how your product will be perceived by the user. And then there's a certain price points that are dictated by the market uh, rather than just being identified by the manufacturer. And there is maintenance that may be necessary. So the, there's a whole slew of influences in this communication. When we just look at what do you want to communicate about a product, then there are basically two things. There are two values. You can call them properties or whatever. I, I like the, the term values. There are actual values and there are perceived values. And the difference is that the actual values, those are things like the technical function, you know, the readability, the technical function is what does this thing do? The readability, how does it do it? The durability, how long will it last? And the production process, how, how has this thing been made? Is the consumer interested in that? And if he's interested, can he see that from the design? And the provenance, where has this thing been made? And today also under what conditions? Then there are things that are more down to earth, like the size and the weight, you know, how heavy how big, how performant, and then about recyclability, which is this thing recyclable, and even more important, or is it sustainable? Can we continue producing that without killing our planet? That's a question that is just there. Among the perceived values, there are things, and we're not talking about the price, we're talking about the actual value, and it can be a monetary value. How much is this worth? And you know, the value of something, how much something is worth is actually exactly as much as somebody is willing to pay for this right now. If it's like 10 days from now, it's already a different value, you know. Then the assistance. How is this product going to help me as a user? The versatility. What, what can I do with it? And I want some reassurance. Will, will I be able to understand that? That's more and more important. You know, we are dealing with sophisticated products, but even something as simple as a bottle opener, if I don't know how to use it, then it's really no good. I'm going to show you some examples here. So, technical function, what does the product do? Ideally, I, as a designer, want you to be expressive with your design. I'm going to repeat this probably 15 times tonight. This is just a simple sphere. And a sphere has the advantage of showing that it's the uh, same importance in all direction. And for a 360 degrees camera like the Luna, this is an appropriate shape, I would say, you know. But still, it's a very generic shape, which can also be used for completely different products, like this loudspeaker with a clip on a headphone, or for this ventilator, which has an airflow in one direction, has no need really to be spherical, and this soccer ball, which has good reason to be spherical, actually, and this piece of furniture, which looks pretty stunning, but wow, it's stunning because it's a sphere, because of the simplicity, or this lamp, you know? So, with one and the same shape, you can show different things, and it's not only the shape is what you can learn from it, but it's also the texture and the details that express your design. So you're not only having the shape as a tool to express via design. If you go to cubic shape, that's not a cube, it's like a flattened cube, but I like the product. It's, it's a fan, and you know, it's suggestive. It shows a little bit with the blade in there, what's going on. 
at the same time it's it's very minimal minimalistic so there there's a medium strong in expression in that design here that's a television set when television was not flat yet that was before your time and that company Brion Vega actually made three different ones and I'll show them all tonight because they managed to really make that cube more cubic every time uh, then there's this nice lamp, which uh, is more of a game. There's no reason why this lamp is, is cubical. There's absolutely no reason, but it has this flap, and when you close it, then the light goes off. At least you believe it. I mean, it's somehow magic. You always want to know, does it really go off when I close it? Of course it does. It has a switch. But it, it's, it's a fun thing to play with, you know? And in this case, to take a neutral shape like a, sphere, uh, like a, like a cube is, is justified by its producing this slightly ironic, mystical feeling. Then there's this radio, you know, which when it's closed, the uh, one in the background, you have no idea what it is until you read Sony, you know that it's not a football. And then when you open it, then you see the volume and you can imagine that this is some uh, acoustical device, you know. Here's in another television set, and it, it actually comes with a, with a filter in the front and then it looks even less like a television set because you can't see the, the tube anymore. And then they did this one that really had three mirrored surfaces and one behind one mirror was the actual tube. So uh, I think that that's interesting how they really tried to make it take the function away and make it less and less visible. So it's the opposite of what I recommend that you should do. But you know, I'm not saying that there are no exceptions to my rule. I suggest to be expressive, but I've designed things that were not expressive because I thought in this character of the product or this client and this brand, needed something very subdued. This is just as an add-on, the same company with this radio. They obviously like to really keep you a little bit in the dark about what this is, you know. So they just have this grill and the perforation suggests that it's either a heater or a radio or something like that. You know? And there's the next computer. I'm not sure you're familiar with that. When Steve Jobs left Apple Computer, he did leave Apple Computer long before he came out with the, back with the iMac. He started his own, uh, his next own company called Next, uh, with a beautiful logo uh, design by Paul Rand, who designed the IBM logo, and that design of my former boss Hartmut Essling and Frog Design. That's the box on the left. Is this cube, it's a magical cube made of magnesium, high tech. It sounded like an old trash can. That's what the, what the criticism was. But because magnesium is incredibly lightweight, if you ever have a a Porsche engine part of magnesium, you think it's made of cardboard. It's so light. It's amazing. It doesn't speak value because we associate value usually a little bit with weight. Although there's, I mean, lead is not expensive, but it's damned heavy, you know. Gold is almost as heavy and, and is really valuable, and platinum is. But magnesium is expensive without being heavy, you know. Don't talk about helium. That is an ex uh, example about showing what something does as a positive example. Here we have very simple shapes. This is a short timer. You can see around the numbers from 0 to 55 suggest that it's a one hour timer. And you see a little window and even the shape of the window, look at the shape of the window, it's a round shape. There's only one reason why this is being round. Because the designer said this is a round object, I want a round window, I want as little distraction from the functionality as possible. I want to keep it very simple and not introduce a new shape. And I think it was extremely successful. R Richard Zappa for Terrayon, French company. Anna Jacobsen, this is a desk light. I, I think it's beautiful. It expresses it exactly. This is not to illuminate the room. This is there to illuminate the space in front of you. And even this uh, circular hole in the foot suggests, OK, this is burned a hole in the foot. You know. We need some surface for the foot, but we don't want it to be visually so heavy, so we make it empty. It's so well done in the detail. That expresses, in a very simple way, a very simple function. So I think that's extremely honest, straightforward. You can't be more straightforward than that. You can be straightforward in other ways. This is a coffee machine, you know. It's the first coffee machine, I think, where they put really the water container and the filter and the, the, the coffee mug uh, in one line, one on top of each other. So you really see, okay, the water goes through the filter and the coffee and then there you have the result. And that was Braun 
there were some detailed problems in the manufacturing somewhere. Somebody had to wiggle all these wires through these uh, steel bars and then the plastic was not as heat resistant as it was supposed to be, so therefore we had some problems with uh, cracks in there, but that's a detail. That's actually a progress. Uh, Philips even showed the shape of the coffee filter, which is even more expressive if you think about that. You know? And they use this as a handle so you can carry the coffee machine around. Why you would carry a coffee machine around is beyond me, but you know, it kind of ties the room together. So this is one of my coffee machines, and it's just to show you, no, it's not expressive as the last one, but it's also a lot more complicated. So on the left, there's a water container, on the right is the coffee con container, and in the middle is where the magic happens. There's actually um, coffee ground, and then compressed, and then there's some water dripping and pre-soaking the coffee before steam is pushed through. It's a very complex thing. And honestly, you know, none of the consumers wants to know in detail how that happens. But I wanted some structure on the surface, on the front, that showed these different parts, the coffee and the water. I wanted that. I wanted the symmetry, and I wanted to separate these parts visually. That was my intent behind, just to explain to you how I, I go about this. And then there are these two outlets for the coffee. And this thing across is the bar to show, yeah, you can height adjust this. You know, there's a handle and you can move this up if you have big mugs or if you have the small espresso ones, you can put, pull it down. That, I think, is a brilliant example that explains how something works. We have a simple peeler for apples and or potatoes or whatever you want to peel with it and it's made of hard plastic and has a soft grip rubber on top that has these little, uh, little elements on the side that are soft. So you indicate where the thumb and the forefinger goes and you suggest that, yeah, because you touch it, it's soft. Oh yeah, this will be nice and my, my fingers will really find their way into this position that is ideal for the peeling. What's interesting about this product is well, that was designed for elderly people and disabled people to make it easier for them to grip. And you see, um, none of us wants to be marginalized as a minority. Oh, well, now I'm older and I'm, I've, I'm beyond my 60s now. I need to get one of these old, old peelers. No, you want to be uh, encouraged to use something that's easy to use for everybody, you know? And that's good to use for everybody. And it was a huge success. You find OXO good grips everywhere at Bed Bath and beyond and, and beyond, you know? So it's, it's a really cool product. Now, please don't think that I drink wine out of cardboard containers. I would be really insulted by that. But I do like the container shape. Uh, it suggests what it does. It collapses after use. You know, you can put it together. It doesn't use as much space in the trash bin. And that, I think, is a, is a, is a big plus. But no, the Chardonnay. I'm, anyway, I'm a red wine drinker. So. <laughs> I think this is a fantastic thing that really shows how it works. You know, this is just a pencil, a pen, a lead holder, and you see that you that that uh, that how do you say bracket? You know, that holds the the lead in the middle, and you can see the color. You know, if if you put a different color in, and you can see how much is used up, and it holds it in place. It's so simple. That is honest. That is a great expression. Yes, please. How do you sharpen it? Hmm. <laughs> it's so long ago that I used the pencil, you know that? <laughs> um, there are special uh, sharpeners for, for only LEDs. Yeah, that's how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, pencil, the thing that you write on this thin paper? You know? <laughs> Another one of my fa favorite products. You know, you can just have a light bulb hanging from the ceiling. This comes as close in its simplicity, and yet it has a vastly improved function. There is a steel wire hanging from the top, and there's a weight at the bottom that keeps it tight. And in the middle, you have this bracket, in Italian, it's parentesis. You know? So it's called parentesi, this lamp. And the fact that it's kind of curved jams the wire inside. So you can very easily adjust the height. It'll just stay where you put it. And then uh, you have this little Thing that you can adjust the angle. It's so simple. There's a switch. It cannot be simpler. You cannot take anything away. 
And that's one other definition that some designers use to describe good quality design. If you cannot take anything away anymore. I don't think we always have to be so minimalist. I don't think we always have to be so simplistic. But I respect it when I see that and it pleases the eye like this one does. You know, it, it explains also how it works. You, know? you could make this jamming mechanism without showing. You could just you know, make it hidden. But the guy said, no, I, I want to show it. I show that this goes around and that's why it jams. It's very clear, very candid. So the question, how long will it last? It can be answered in many different ways because there's different ways how design can last. This is one of my favorite examples. This machine here, KitchenAid mixer, has been produced since 100 years without any significant change to the design. 100 years. I mean, I know young kids that say, oh, I love this machine, it looks so cool. Some say, it looks so old, it must be from the whatever. No, it's from 1918. It's really old. So how long will it last? In this case, the design forever, you know? Sometimes there are adaptations, like with this beetle, you know, that looks different today, but it still has the basic concept of having these fenders separate from the body and these round shapes that suggest some, uh, some protective uh, qualities. And how, how they advertised it in the 60s, I think, Mr. Bill Bernbach, a big advertising guy, they painted it on an egg and they said, oh, some shapes are hard to improve and it just shows it. Yeah, that's why it seems almost familiar to us, the shape, you know. Among all the cars, it was the one where generations said, that's, I love the Beetle. Oh, this car is cool, this is cheaper, this is more expensive, this is faster, but this is just, I, this is cool. Also because it was affordable and many young people had it and then nostalgia kicks in. But that's justified. Uh, you can also debate how long a design concept will last. And when you look at this radio from uh, 1950, 60, and the iPod, Jonathan Ive, the Apple design vice president, has admitted that he had been inspired by that, by the simplicity and the direct and candid approach of Dieter Rams. So this is how design can last. But you can also look at the actual a suggestive uh, technical duration of a product, you know? And G-Shock is a good example. They do these watches that look like they can outlast any kind of shock. Already the name, I mean, G-Shock is how many Gs? Well, usually one G, you know? Well, maybe if I jump down a ladder, I can get to two and a half or what? Or if I go in a fast car, I get two more, but we're not astronauts, you know? We're not exposed to so much gravity increase. So here they, they use the design language to talk about how rugged it is, how long-lasting it is by, by using these bold shapes. They really go to extreme. I, I like that concept very well. What I think sucks is, is Casio is one of the first companies to do digital watches. And still today, that display quality is lousy. It's really lousy. I, mean, I have se several G-Shocks, and one of them you have to stand in the sun, and if the angle hits right, you can read it. You know, it's great. But I'd like something that I can always read. I mean, here, the, of course, the, the hands are easy to see, but the readout already is, is, is pixelated. And, you know, we are beyond that. We are used to other qualities of displays. And if you look at the small thing up here, pardon my French, but I'm too old for that shit. You know, like, <laughs> really? Then one question is, how has it been made? And I want to, to show you two examples to show how design also has progress. I mean, when you look at furniture, the German word for furniture is Möbel, and the French is Möbel. And it comes very simply from people having houses. And a house consists of walls, windows, roof, and floor. And everything you put in there is mobile. And that's where the name Möbel comes from. Eh? Everything that can move around is furniture. And uh, the first piece of furniture that had to be mobile, they were made of wood, you know? And if you lived 500 years ago in a village, you wanted a piece of furniture, you went to the carpenter and said, I want basically the same thing that my neighbor has to sit on, you know, so I don't have to sit on the floor. And then they made something in wood, and then they got more sophisticated and made things like that, in the Art Nouveau style, for example, where they suggest a little bit uh, where the material comes from by showing floral design, you know? 
incomes, our deco incomes in Bauhaus. And what they did, they said, we're revolutionary. We're using plumber's materials. We're using steel tubes and we are bending them. And we show the leather not around a pillow or so, but we show the leather just as a strip. The leather is the soft part and the steel tube is the hard part. They were extremely honest in showing how this thing was made. And that, I think, is, is, is remarkable, you know? And it's still today, that looks cool furniture, and that's from 1925 or something. And even today, you find examples where it's very clear how it has been done. There's the Campana brothers that do a welding of a structure, and then they take these ropes. They always use this ready-made material. They go around in the areas in Brazil where they're from and then they, in the industrial areas where you can get all these raw materials and they say, oh, we just you know, put these loops around and you can see how it was made. It's just, they use enough that it becomes soft. It's very witty, it's very smart, it's very straightforward. You can debate to what extent it's industrial design because a lot of, there's either a very sophisticated robot program putting these ropes around or I guess some maybe not so highly paid people that do that for the manufacturer. But after all, it's furniture design, and furniture is never that industrial. Now, if we look about provenance, the question where has something been made, we come uh, to different levels of debate. And today you see made in China, and some people say, oh, see, it's made in China. I say, yeah, what's wrong with made in China? Obviously, you can make super high tech products there, you know? I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong, and I think. It took Apple a, a while to get there because they had this design by Apple in California and, uh, you know, designed by Apple in Cupertino, suggesting that uh, we want to talk about how local we are and we're still producing in China. Now, I don't want to get political here, don't misunderstand me, but I just think that when I was talking to a Chinese company, I encouraged them to use something made in China because today we know that the iPhone comes from China, so we know there's high tech coming from China. So why would this be something you would not want to talk about? In the past, yes, I understand. How this can change over the years, I'll show with another example. Made in Germany. As a German, of course, I was confronted with that first. And I learned and read out that in 1890-something, there was a British law introduced because the German industry produced low quality copies of British products. And the Brits said, no more of that. Now we require every German product to have a made in Germany stamp on it. So the Germans complied with that. And within less than 10 years, they improved the production quality to a higher degree than the Brits had. And that whole situation was exacerbated in the Second World War, which in case you don't know, was over in 1945, when the Allied forces decided to first we're going to take these Germans, justifiable because we had invaded the whole of Europe twice in that century, we take these Germans and make them small. So Britain, you want to take some factories from Germany, feel free. So the Brits went there, disassembled factories, brought them to England. And then came the situation of the Cold War, and the Americans said, hmm, we want Germany to be at least the western part that's ruled by our allied forces without the Russians, to be strong, uh, as a bulwark against the, the Russians, so let's help them with some finances. And the Marshall Plan was developed, and the Marshall Plan basically gave Germans enough money to build new production techniques. So all of a sudden, you had the situation that Germany was happily producing with the most recent high-tech machines and competing with Britain having the old German stuff. And that, again, gave Made in Germany a big boost. And that's how Made in Germany got from a very low, almost an insult, to something as a high quality, and still is today. If you ask me 20 years ago what, what I have thought about uh, Made in America, I would say, well, there was this thing going on. The Germans make this precision stuff. The Japanese make this tiny micro mechanics very well. And uh, the American makes the stuff that is rugged, but you know, is a little bit rickety, but, but it's very rugged, very long lasting, you know, but not elegant. And I had a motor in my garage here in Newport Beach that uh, was just exchanged. And you couldn't get any more spare parts because this thing was so old. And it did, still did the job beautifully. But it looked like really jerry-rigged together. I mean, it had plastic wood on the box. Why? On a ceiling in the garage, nobody looks at whether it's wood or not. 
and, and, and it, it looked really awkward. It didn't look like an industrial product at all, but it worked, you know. So that was the original Made in America. And today, I would say Made in America is products like Belkin or Bose, is high tech, good quality, excellent, you know, of course. That's what we think, or Levi's jeans, or Harley Davidson, or all the other things that we want to tax you when you start taking. No, no, we're not talking about that. Okay. I'm trying to surf by that, you know. There are these other questions of the actual value, and I don't want to discuss everything in detail because some of this gets boring. I mean, you learn in first term how to show that things are bigger than they are, or smaller than they are, or heavier or not, and performance, all that is, is pretty straightforward. Recyclability, I have an interesting example, that's a television called Gym Nature, that was done in the 90s, I think, by Philip Stark for a French uh, television company, and it shows, you know, whether it's recyclable, uh, at least it suggests that, well, I'm made out of old wood chopped up, you know, and suggest that you can recycle it. You can actually not because it's soaked with so much polyester resin that it's not easy to recycle. But an attempt was made, an attempt was made, and I have to give them credit here, you know, everything starts somewhere. It's like the new Karma car that you can drive with the electricity that the sunroof produces, the, the solar cells on the roof produces. You can drive one to three miles, you know, and then you've got to wait a while for sunshine again, or use the inbuilt battery, or use the inbuilt, so it has a lot of other possibilities. But it's the first serially produced car that works on solar power. That's great. You know? So everything starts small scale. You know? So then, doesn't, sorry, Derek, yeah? doesn't that count as a communicated lie then, if it's, if it's, if it's trying to communicate that it was That's a very good question. And that's something, you know, I'm, I'm here to make you ask those questions. So I'm very glad you, you're coming up with that. And we can discuss that, I suggest, afterwards. Um, my, and then I'll tell you my personal opinion. But please keep it in mind, and let's come back to that. Now it's interesting. It's about the perceived values. And I think that's a very important part of our job, to communicate these values. How much is something worth? I'm not talking about the price. I'm talking about the value. The assistance, how is this product going to help me? How, what can I do with it? And will I be able to understand it? I want some assurance, you know? So how much is it worth? You know the Vertu? Vertu is the high-end brand of Nokia. And I always had trouble understanding that concept, you know? They say, well, these telephones cost ten, twenty thousand dollars and yes, you can phone with them, and there's no guarantee that the talks you have on the phone are more pleasant than with another phone. So that's already the problem of every expensive television. Is the program going to get better? No, you don't know. How do they try to get the, justify the enormous price tag? Do they do that by a different size? No. Nope. Proportion? No. Nope. It's everything pretty much like this here, you know? first iPhone. Um, they do it by the concierge button. The concierge button means that if you need tickets for that concert end of the month here in the Hollywood Bowl and you forgot, well, yeah, if you forgot, then you need to spend 20000 Not really. Uh, they try to do it with this leather, high quality leather. I think it always gets funny when they justify it with the technology, but this has really good sound quality. Uh, wait a minute, Nokia. If I buy your top-of-the-line Nokia phone for, I don't know how much it is, let's say $800, does that mean I get second-grade sound quality? Of course not. They can never justify it in the market where there's Apple. It says, for our iPhone X, we have the latest and greatest, so you don't need to spend ten or 20000 for that. So. How do you show how, how much it's worth with the materials? With showing a digital, instead of a digital clock, uh, an analog clock that's supposed to look like high-end, but then of course these are not diamonds and it's not artisanal engraving, but it's just a visual rendering. So I th I'm, I'm actually, I'm just surprised why people buy this at all. I think it's people that really have a hard time finding a place where to put their money because they have so much of it. I, I really think so. And if you think this is expensive, I went to Geneva once and I saw in a shop a phone for $120,000. Uh, I don't make that kind of call, you know. So I think that is much more straightforward. But if you talk about how expressive and how open that is, 
Well, in the end, it's just a screen, so it is quite straightforward, like any phone that looks like that. And Apple was a bit the trailblazer for this kind of shape, you know, so there's a lot of lookalikes. I always wonder when, what, what would I do different for a mobile phone? And I decide to really start to think about it when somebody pays me big bucks. How is a product going to help? And I think that's a good example. That is this uh, light lamp that's uh, for third world countries. You know, a lot of people on this planet do not have access to electricity. And what it means is that they suffer consequences like not being able to work at night. If you think this is hard to imagine and how does daylight actually have such an impact, I can tell you that my life here in California is very different from my life in Paris and it has to do with the sun and other, other things. So my life in Paris is, and please don't laugh, I'm getting up, I'm waking up at 8.30, 9.30 and then you know, I do some sports and I start to work and go through during the day and at 8 o'clock in the evening I stop working slowly and then, you know, with my girlfriend, we say, okay, are we invited or do we go out for a drink at 8.30, 9 o'clock? And then you go for dinner. And uh, around midnight, you come home and you go to bed maybe and you read for an hour or so and at 1 or 2 o'clock, you fall asleep. And here, it's different, particularly in winter when the sun goes down at 4.30, you know. It, it also goes down early in Paris, but it's, it's different. It's a big city. It's, it's, everything is different. So you, uh, uh, today we were going to dinner at before six o'clock, you know, it's like, mm, this is very, very, very unusual. I mean, I know French people at, at five o'clock are still at the uh, lunch table, you know. So here everything starts to, to stop at 10 o'clock, the restaurants close. So what do you do? You oh, I don't know, go to bed, except of course, if you're young, you go to the discotheque and dance at four o'clock in the morning. But you know, in my age, you don't do this anymore. So my, my my schedule depends on the daylight. If you don't have electric light, it's even worse, you know. You work during the day, you come home, you maybe want to study if you're a spying person, but you don't have any light. And this is where this comes in. You put it out five hours in the sunlight, it provides two hours of electric light and allows you to study. So in sm small community, uh, communities, people can get educated. It's a very important product. And it shows it with a very friendly appeal and showing this stylized sun. I think it's, it's really brilliant. This is another very funky, I'm not even sure it's a real product, but it nicely expresses how this is going to help. You know, there's a USB stick and if that locks closed, you can't, can't get access to the data, at least not easily. Another nice example of what can I do with this product, you know? Here, very simple, I have a flashlight, or as Brits say, a torch, and if you put it on there, you don't have to have any light in there, it's just basically a distributor of that light that is created by that little bulb, the little LED bulb in the flashlight. And the, the shape suggests everything this does. You, know, you don't need an uh, introduction, you don't need an instruction manual, it's crystal clear. And last not least, the question, will I understand it? This is a product that is, of course, not so familiar to you because it consists of a record player from left to right, then a tape recorder, then a radio, and an amplifier, all in one housing. And it was a pretty brilliant design at the time because if you look at the amount of buttons there, it's like flying an airplane. It does not say, oh, you want to listen to music? Come here. It says, I'm going to scare the hell out of you. <laughs> You're not going to find out how to switch on your favorite station or to make this tape recorder work if you haven't read the manual. It suggests that there's three lines, and in the first line you have the most important things, you know, to switch it on and off, control the volume, the station, put the band forward or backward, or make the record player move. And the second one are the less important ones that basically you don't need to know. If you never operate them, the thing will still work quite well. You can just not fine-tune it. And the third one is just for reading. You know, the, those are just readouts, little LEDs, and and meters that, that tell you what's going on with the machine. I think this is an example that really explains very well a very complex matter. Of course, you can also do that in a completely different way, and that's a more modern way how to do it, with an interface that basically has one appearance, and then if you tap on it, you can access deeper menu options and so on. And if you go there, you can adjust, you see the temperature. I think it's a brilliant piece of design. 
It's it's very straightforward. It's it's very it, it, it says what it does. It's not disturbing. It <laughs> blends into the environment. It's really really remarkable. That is a study I found. You know, segways. These machines that can stand on and move around. And that is a vacuum cleaner with a Segway mechanism because one of the issues about vacuum cleaning is one of the household chores I like to do and don't laugh about it, I really do, because I have a Dyson, uh, that you pull it behind and it never follows you really. You know, the Dyson, I don't want to criticize, it's a good machine, but this one is like a Segway, so it's much more easily to move it on these two wheels only, which can be big and therefore deal with any steps or carpets much more easily than, than a small wheel does. And at the same time, all the details are simplified and minimized, and it's, it's very sec very, very candid. When you think about something as simple as a light switch, then it shows you on which level something can be expressive. I mean, it also has to do with the experiences of the user, as I told you before. And, you know, we're all used to light switches, but if you show that to somebody from a different planet who has never seen a light switch before, would he even know what to do with it? Would he start to turn on that wheel around? Or what, what would, he, would he even realize that this is different than the wall around it? You know, We are used to reading this. For us, this is a sign. And there are even different ways to show that. There's this old porcelain one that we understand intuitively that this means on and this means off. And these signs have been carried over. And today, even non-mechanical switches that are like this with a light, we understand how they work, but it depends on our experience. And you know, for your grandparents, it may not be as logical as for you. There have been attempts made to make products easily understandable, in this case for young target groups. is something I bought my daughter when she was little, and so long ago and uh, had this color support and just very few buttons to make it really easy to understand how I can record and play back music on this tape recorder. And uh, this is uh, an attempt to make create a, uh, a cheap and easily understandable computer for third world countries where you can even crank up some energy in case you're out of battery. So the color but also the simplicity of the shapes and the arrangement of the components and also the large radii suggest it's for kids, it's simple, it's encouraging in this way. And Baron Olufsen had a phone which is still one of my favorite phones. I don't have this anymore since a long time, but it, it was very simple and it still had options. I mean, it had this little scotch uh, posted notebook on the side. If you could slide it away, you could note down the, pre, the, the, the speed dials that you could easily memorize. And all this was working so simple and so beautiful. Everything was very logic. Actually, mine even had a readout there. This doesn't have the readout because that even showed what you were typing and what number. So it was really, really great product. Now, to talk about other stories, how is design that is expressing, is very expressive, this is very expressive, but what does it express? I'm sorry, look at it, but what, what's wrong with this story? This guy has hair made of toothpicks, but at the same time, he pulls out one hair and threatens you with it, and he <laughs> smiles at the same time. Is this supposed to be ridiculous? Yep, of course it is. Is this, is this, is this a good joke? I mean, I'm asking you. I'm, I, I have my opinion about that, but I'm, I'm not a dictator, so I accept other opinions. I, I always have trouble with that. There are things that I have more trouble with is this hedgehog. This hedgehog is supposed to grate Parmesan cheese. Now, you can laugh about me, but I looked up, and yes, hedgehogs are slightly lactose intolerant. And you should not feed them cheese, and what they will get is diarrhea. And if you think you take a piece of cheese and out comes thin stuff at the base of the hedgehog, and you know about the diarrhea, you cannot forget that, you know? I think it's just wrong. It's really wrong. And it's so far from being candid. That's just my opinion. So at the end, I have four rules for you that hopefully help you navigate your design challenges a little bit. Number one, please be aware. Because you are a communicator. You have to know that. You have to take this to your heart and work based on that. Number two, what's important? That is something that you decide. You're working with a market. You're working with uh, your client. You're working for a consumer, but in the end, it's you who decides what you want to communicate based on your input, of course. You're not working in a vacuum. 
but you are the person that decides about the shape. Of course, the client in the end will say which of the three versions he will take, so he will decide, he will have the feeling, but you better show him three versions where if he takes the worst, it's still a good design. Otherwise, you suck, I'm sorry. And then design expressively. Don't be boring. Don't hold anything back. Go out there and show what's going on with the product. Put the emphasis in a way that's visually perceivable for the people that deal with your product. And number four, don't lie, because it's just not sustainable. You can lie, but my experience is you can lie to people once, and the second time they won't believe it. Except, no, I'm not going to say anything politically. Uh, so really, sustainability is important not only when we talk about the environment and ecology, but it's also important in business. If you want to make a good deal, a good deal is not where you rip somebody off. A good deal is that kind of deal that both parties want to make again any time. They want to do it again because it was such a good deal for both of them. And the deal you are making with a consumer is that you are providing him with an exciting, interesting, understandable, working product that he would like so much that he would say, well, I really want to see what this company does again, what this designer does again, what can I expect again from these people? That was it, thank you very much. <laughs> now there's a little bit of questions and answers at the end and I suggest we go back to your question. I, th I think they called it gym nature. They wanted to suggest that it's close to nature, it's not just plastic, you know. And I think they put more of an emphasis, if I recall correctly, that it was made from recycled materials, then it was recyclable afterwards. You know? oh, okay. But I, honestly, I don't know the details. I don't have that in my heart. But I think you're asking the right question. And about the hybrids, yeah, basically, you, everybody can imagine, if you build a car that has two engines there, it's twice as pollution in the production process as making one engine. It's really, you can say 0 0.8, but it, it's basically twice as bad, you know? That said, it's, we are in a transitional period, you know? So they are trying to bridge from combustion engine cars to electric cars, and this uh, facilitates the transition. That would be my excuse to bluntly advertise this as very environmental friendly. No, I, I've, I always said, you know, when you look at some old Renaults or Peugeots or Citroëns and French streets, yeah, to drive that until it's dead, it's, it's much more environmental friendly. A friend of mine has a Deux Chevaux, uh, which is, by the way, one of the most value retenting cars. It's better than a Ferrari, you know. I did not believe it, but when he moved away from France, he tried to sell it and said, you'll never sell it. That was the first thing that went from all his stuff. You know, people were throwing money at him for that. It was amazing. It's more than the original cost. You know, and that, that's quite remarkable for a car that's always been cheap. But it just it never goes, it's a, it was very well maintained. It was a, owner was a transportation designer. But if I make you ask these questions, uh, I'm already quite happy because it shows that you understood what, what, is a, what my issue was, what my, my desire was to familiarize you with this questioning why are you, com wh what are you communicating and why are you communicating it? What do you want to say with your design? I want you to be very aware. I want you to understand your profession as something exciting and exhilarating. I love being a designer, but uh, you have duties, you have responsibilities that you can't escape. And uh, you'll be more successful if you accept these responsibilities and will, you will be taken more seriously. That does not mean that you will end up here or there doing a product where you say, well, you know, the client wanted this, I wanted that. That always happens, that's normal. You have to be able to make a compromise. If you can't compromise, you can't be in a stable relationship and you can't work as a designer. That's my experience. And I'm divorced, I know what I'm talking about. Really? <laughs> okay. But I'm in a stable relationship. So uh, at least I've learned something, I hope. Or, or I have this super smart girlfriend, which is the truth, you know. That's a good question. That's a very good question. It's very difficult to answer. My spontaneous um, uh, flippant response would be because an engineer never knows what's pretty. 
And you know, beauty is a concept that is absolutely valuable. I believe, uh, Torres Sotzer said, if one thing will save us, beauty will. I really, I'm convinced there is a concept of beauty. Can I mathematically describe how I get there? Absolutely not. I have no clue how I do it. And I try to do it with every product. I want to make it beautiful. And you know, the, the more you take away, the less you have to show that beauty. At the same time, the more you take away, the less distracts from the beauty, you know. So uh, to strive for the concept of beauty is something very honorable and very good too. And that's another success recipe, if you ask me. Try to make beautiful stuff. For that, you have to understand what is beautiful. And I can tell you, when I was 10 years old, wow, my concept of beauty was very different than today. So I continue to learn I, I try to describe what is elegant, you know. I have this vague notion that uh, a sphere is the least elegant shape. The moment you make it flatter, it becomes more elegant. If you make it longer, perhaps it gets even more elegant, like a pen. But this is just a theory, and you cannot make everything a pen shape, you know. So I'm thinking, how can I minimize things? How, where do I stop leaving things away? Because then it gets boring, that's another risk, you know. Not only become engineering, but boring. But I'm never afraid that we can be replaced by engineers. No, engineers don't look at things like that. They have another responsibility. Their responsibility is to make sure this thing works 10 years from now, at least five years from now. And that is such a difficult responsibility. I don't want to be in charge of that. I mean, what, I mean, it's so difficult to look in the future anyway, and we do that for design. Mark Twain has said, prognosis are very difficult to do, particularly when they concern the future. And I think he was absolutely right. <laughs> now we, in our jobs, we look into the future. We look into what could be good, you know. That's already pretty magical. And it's exciting. Yeah, take things away, but not too much. What was, it? was it Einstein who said, make it as simple as you can, but not any simpler. You know, <laughs> at least, these stupid quotes or these very intelligent quotes that describe the conundrum in which you find yourself. To simplify, but not too much. To take away, but leave the right things there. You know, that Michelangelo said, how did, did you create this beautiful sculpture? You just knocked on the stone and took everything away that didn't belong there. Yeah, that's a little bit what we do, just not with marble. You know, we do it with polyethylene or something like that. <laughs>
and said, yeah, I want to make this transfer of like $100 or so to insurance in Germany. It's something I do like every month, you know, and I can't do this automatically because of cross country lines. I don't know why. Anyway, and the guy said, oh, I need to see an ID. So I take out my multilingual German driving license, credit card size here, boom, has all the languages in the back and it's very clear and he says, no, that's not an idea. I said, sure, that's an idea. It's my photo, it's my name and everything is an European authority. He said, no, I need to see your passport. I said, can I talk to my, my counselor? He said, um, because he knows me. He said, well, I know you too, but I need to see an ID. <laughs> I mean, this is why in America you probably start ready to cry. And uh, as a journalist, I'm grating my teeth. In Germany, I would say, hey, what's this up? You're not getting anywhere in France. So you stay always polite and say, oh, I happen to know that in your file you have a photocopy of my passport. He said, well, that's the last option. And that's why I lost my temper, which in French you still remain very polite. You said, no, that's not the last option. It should be the first option because I'm your client, you know. And then he mumbled something and in the end he did that transfer. And I thought, this is doubly insulting. Does he want to show me that he's not following the rules? He just messed with me? That's impolite. Or does he want to say that actually wasn't that important? He's just insulting. You know, and he probably thinks he did a good job because he did what I wanted. That's the least thing he can do. They have no understanding of service. They think basically the customer is always wrong. That's something that's scary, you know. This is not pleasant, this is not nice. And there are other things that are very, very difficult here, you know. There are things that I appreciate about my life here. It's, it's wonderful. I mean, these palm trees, the weather, the people are so friendly. You're driving, you can go to this intersection and who comes first? Is the first one allowed to go? That would never work in Germany because there has to be a rule. And if you're not following the rule, I'm going to tell you because I'm not a policeman, but I'm working as one now because I'm German. You know, that's that's scary. In France, it's very simple. You just drive. You expect that everybody else stops. You know, you, you just move. As long as you move, everything is okay. So there are very different attitudes, and yeah, moving around in traffic in these different countries helps you to realize that there's different ways to solve one problem, to solve the togetherness in traffic. There's the German way, where there's strict regulations. On the highway, nobody overtakes on the right. It's forbidden, and people stick to that. So when you overtake, you know, and you're, you're on the left lane, you never have to worry someone's coming on the right. But if you're on the right lane, driving at, say, 80 miles per hour, you cannot just look in the rearview mirror and go over. Because maybe somebody crazy, like myself, when I had this big fast car, coming along at 240 kilometers per hour, and, and you know, you can hardly break in time to not run you over. Be because everybody sticks to that rules, it works. And in France, they have rules, but everybody ignores them. They are basically anarchists. So everybody expects everybody to break the rules. So at green, nobody just goes across the intersection because somebody could just ignore the red, so you better watch it, you know? And that also works. It's just a German in Paris with a German attitude doesn't work. And if I drive in Germany, I adjust, readjust back to German style. And the same goes for business. You know? When you have a business meeting with a person from Spain, half an hour you talk about that he came by car and he came through Venice and he brought this really nice grappa for you and how nice Venice is and for half an hour. In Germany you go there and say, hi, I'm Wolfgang, I'm here for the presentation. So, your briefing was this, boof, and then you start right away. And nobody's offended. And as I said before, if you have a nice demeanor and you put on a smile and your work is good, people will accept you even if you do the Spanish style in Germany or the German style in Spain. So something is to be said about politeness and being friendly, that helps, and being open-minded. Yeah, absolutely be open-minded. Don't think, I mean, I grew up, I thought German train system is the best. And then I found out that the French have 10 times the rolling stock in high-speed trains. And we had a big accident once, an accident that is based on the principle, the technical principle that German high-speed trains are made of. Could not happen in France. So maybe the French trains are better. They are actually very good. And then you find out that the fastest high-speed train rolls in Spain. You know? And you take away this idea that other countries are unified. I always laugh and some Germans say, so how is it in America now? How are these Americans? Yeah, yeah, 300 million people, all the same. You know, all think the same. You know, right? What stupid idea is that? You know, you can unfortunately never generalize. There's nothing to do with design, but we use prejudice as a social navigation instrument. When you come into a room, 
you have to deal with all this unknown. You have to, uh, all these young people here, they will all think, no, they will not. This guy will think, what is this old fart saying here? This person will think, oh, this guy looks experienced, you know, and both are right, you know. <laughs> this is really what it sums up to. You have to accept why we use prejudice, and prejudice has to do with consumer expectation also. Don't make fun of consumer expectation. You put a new coffee machine next to an old coffee machine, and at least 60% will say, oh, my aunt has this, my mother has this, my neighbor has that. I, I prefer that, you know, and even with this brilliant design, if you get 40% acceptance, you have a big party. You will never get 40% acceptance. So most people say, yeah, what, what, ah, it's a coffee machine. Yeah, yeah. It looks like a coffee machine. It looks different than that. And I'm used to that. They don't say that, but it's what they feel. So be prepared that people are not always flexible, and be prepared to be flexible yourself, is my advice. Thank you very much. I wish you a nice evening. Yeah? It was a real pleasure.